Okay, so we're going to be making a context-free grammar for this language, which is 0 to the n, 1 to the m, 2 to the m, 3 to the n, where n and m are at least 0. So one thing that you should always be aware of when making a context-free grammar for anything is any relationship between the counts here. So n and m are at least 0, but there's nothing in common between them, such as like n has to be greater than m or equal or whatever. Another thing that you should be aware of when making a context-free grammar is where are counts of the variables located? So one thing we should be aware of right here in this language is that the n's are on the outside and the m's are on the inside. So one thing that you could do is to look at this grammar from the inside out because it's somewhat looking in that particular way because the ends are on the outside and the inner counts are over here. So the ends, if we look at them in isolation, we can easily make a context-free grammar for that because we can just make a one on one side, a two on the other side, and then just quit at some point with the empty string. For this part, I'm going to have a variable called x make that part. So x is going to make one x two or empty. And that's essentially the same thing as zero to the n, one to the n, but instead I'm substituting one and two here. How do we build this thing up? Well, if we look at those parts in isolation too, it's essentially the same idea, but with a zero on the front and a three on the end. But the difference here is that the x part, whatever x makes, is on the inside and is completely separate from this. So whenever the grammar decides, okay, I want to start working on the ones and twos, we need to stop making the zeros and threes because there are no zeros and threes in the middle. So I'm going to have a variable called s be making this part, the whole thing, which is going to be 0s1. So that's, oh, not 1. That should be a 3. So 0s3. So that's making a 0 on the front, 3 on the end, and then just working our way in. And then eventually we want to start making the 1s and 2s, and that's handled by x here. So I need to be able to switch over and then not have any way of going back up here because I don't have zeros and threes in the middle. And I should also note that this is the start variable and not x. Okay, so let's make a context-free grammar for this language, which is 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the m, 3 to the n, where n and m are at least 0. I forgot to put the such that here. So we should note here that n and m are at both at least zero, but there's no correlation between them. So they're, they don't have to be equal or one bigger than the other or anything. They're just arbitrary. And notice that the n's here corresponding to zero and one are all on the left side, and the m's are completely on the right side. And because we know from over here that n and m have no relation to each other whatsoever, we can somewhat decompose the problem into this problem involving the zeros and ones and this problem involving the twos and threes. So what we could do then is to have a variable I'm gonna call x1 make the zero and one part and another variable called x2 to make the two and three part. Well, they're essentially the same idea because there's no relation between an n and m and it's just changing characters because the essential structure is unchanged. However, anything that x1 makes, whatever we do it, uh, has to be before whatever x2 makes via concatenation. So let's figure out what x1 makes. So x1 has to make 0 to the n, 1 to the n, and that should be fairly easy to do at this point. So 0 on the front, then recursively go in, and then a 1 on the end, or empty. And then x2 is going to be exactly the same idea, but with uh, x2 and 2 and 3 as the terminals instead of 0 and 1. And then how do we combine these together? Well, we can just follow the picture because x1 goes first, x2 goes second. So then my start variable, which I'm going to always call s in any grammar I make, is going to be s, which is going to produce anything that x1 can make and then x2, whatever x2 can make. So whatever x1 makes, concatenated with whatever x2 makes. And so therefore, this is a grammar for this particular language. Okay, so let's make a context-free grammar for this language, which I'm informally writing as non-palindromes over zero and one. So if you don't remember, a palindrome is a string that is exactly the same when read one way and the other way. 
So as an example, a palindrome over 0 and 1 could, in principle, be 0, 1, 1, 0. So if we read it uh, going forward and going backward, it's identically the same string. And a non-palindrome, if we just change one of the characters, in fact, you can change any of the characters here. So let's do 0, 1, 0, 0. Then clearly the badness is happening between the 1 and the 0 here. But it could also be that we have a 1 over here, and that this character was a 1 here. So the badness has to happen at some point. But what can happen on either side, as long as the two halves are the same length on either side, so the badness is at the, this 0 and this 1 this time, if the badness happens at the same distance from either end, it doesn't matter what happens on either end as long as it's the same distance, because if we read it this way, and then this way, it needs to have a different character because we're talking about non-palindromes. And so therefore, once we get to here, if we look at what happens on the inside, it could be, in principle, anything also. And in fact, it could be anything at all. It doesn't have to be the same length or even or whatever. How can we make a context for grammar for this? This behavior right here has to happen at the same distance from either end. But it could be any characters at all on either side. It doesn't matter that they're the same or different or anything. So I'm going to make a context-free grammar right here. So I'm going to have a start variable called s. And I'm going to, at first, generate the same characters on either side. So 0s0 zero, zero, or 1s1. One, so that's the same on either side. But if we want to generate a 0 and a 1, or a 1, 0, then that will correspond to a bad behavior, which is what we want in this particular language, because it's non-palindromes. If we want to apply a rule with a 0 on the front and a 1 on the end, I can't go back here, because then that would imply that this was a not-yet-okay behavior. What we want to do is we want to go to a different variable I'm going to call x, and x is going to handle actually getting to a string of terminals, which is what we want. And the other condition of 1, x, 0 is also going to be here. So note that s is finally complete at this point, and notice that there's no right-hand side corresponding to s with no variables on it. Every single one of these has a variable. So therefore, if we want to actually make a string of terminals, we have to go through the x, one of these two rules right here, which involve x. And so therefore, if we did that, then we must have generated different characters at the same distance from either end, which corresponds to non-palindromes. And so therefore, we can, at, at x's point, we can just generate whatever. So 0x or 1x or empty. So it doesn't matter what happens in the middle, as long as it's the same distance from either end. And so therefore, that is a context-free grammar for the set of non-palindromes over 0, 1. Okay, so let's make a context-free grammar for this language, which is 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, where n is at least 0, and notice the little bar upstairs, which indicates complement. So it's the set of all strings that are not in this set. So 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, any string that is not of that form is in this language. And what we want to do is we want to make a CFG for this. So how can we actually do that? Notice that the original language without the complement on it is not context-free, and so therefore there is no context-free grammar for it. So we got to exploit some properties of the original language in order to be able to make a context-free grammar for it. So let's consider what the strings look like. Well, every string in the original language has some zeros, ones, and twos, and it's the same number of each. So how can we actually make a grammar for them? So what do the strings in the complemented language look like? So all strings in this language are of the form, and there are going to be quite a few here. So if the string that we're considering has a one zero in it, it can't be of this form because it has zeros before one. So a uh, substring of 0, 1. I just realized while recording this video, I needed to say 1, 0 here, not 0, 1. That was my mistake. If it has a substring of 2, 1, because every string in the original language has 1s, then 2s, and this is in the wrong order. And then if it has a substring of 2, 0, and then those will all be strings in the 
complement language. So considering any string that is not one of these three, then it must be zeros, ones, and then twos, but it has the counts being wrong in some way. We have it of the form zero to the i, one to the j, two to the k. So it's some set of zeros, then ones, then twos, where either i is not equal to j, i is not equal to k, or j is not equal to k. And we will make a context-free grammar for this thing, and it's going to be a pain in the neck. So let's get started. So I realized while recording this that the grammar is absolutely massive, and what I want to do is to show you the context-free part, not how to generate the regular language part. So all three of these right here are regular. And you can easily make a DFA and therefore a context-free grammar for each of these three. What I want to show you is four. So here I'm going to just say that x1 generates all strings with one zero, x2 is all strings with uh, two one, and x3 is all strings with two zero. And I invite you to actually work out the details of how that works, but I'm gonna focus on x4 because that's the interesting part. I'm actually only gonna focus on one part of it Well, I want you to work out the rest of the details, but it's almost identical. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna erase this because I don't need it anymore. And I'm gonna make some space right here. So I have all strings of zeros, then ones, then twos, where i is not j, i is not k, or j is not k. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on this. So x4 is going to make three variables, which is one for each of these three cases. So I'm gonna have a y, which is gonna say i not equal to j. That is the variable name corresponding to making strings where i is not equal to j. Or uh, I have i not equal to k, or y uh, j not equal to k. And I'm only gonna focus on that one, but all the other ones are very, very similar. So let's focus on what i not equal to j is. Well, we should know when we're making a context-free grammar, anytime we see a not equal condition, we should always transform that into one is less than the other or the second is less than the first. So I'm gonna have two more variables where I have y i less than j or y i bigger than j. So then now we've transformed this into two variables where it's a lot easier to figure out what to do. So let's focus on this one, i less than j. What does that mean? That means that the number of zeros is less than the number of ones, and I don't care about the twos. So that means that I can do something like this, generate the zeros and ones in equal order, like this, and then at some point later, I want to generate all of the twos, and also at least one more one. So I'm gonna have at least one more thing being made, I'm gonna call it Z, so z is going to make uh, at least zero more ones, like this. So here, what I have is that z makes at least zero ones, and then y i less than j must make at least one one before it can actually make a string of terminals because the, the empty string is down here. And so therefore, y i less than j makes this original part of the string without the twos, but in order to get the twos, we can just stick a different variable right here. I'm gonna call it B on both ends of right here. And then B is just going to spout off as many twos as it wants. So it's effectively what Z does, but just for twos. And then how to handle this one is to have Y I bigger than J. What it's gonna make is uh, them an equal number. So I bigger than J instead right here. But then now I wanna make at least one more zero. So here we made at least one more one. I wanna make at least one more zero here. So zero, and then I'm gonna make a different variable. Let's call it C. C is gonna make at least zero more zeros. And so therefore Y I bigger than J must make at least one more zero than one, which is exactly what we want. If you wanna finish up all the work for these two, all that you need to do for this one is to ignore the ones and then make the zeros and twos an equal number, and then at some point later, namely in this part, you're going to recursively work on the ones. So notice that the zeros and twos are on the either end. You just make the zeros and twos an equal number, 
eventually making more twos or more zeros depending on which one you're working on. And then in the middle, you call a different variable, namely z in this case, because it makes any number of ones that it wants. And then this one, you ignore the zeros and then do the exact same idea as right here, but with the ones and twos instead. Hi, so let's make a context-free grammar for this language, which is the set of all strings of the form a to the i, so i a's, j b's, and k c's, where the number of a's is at most, or equal to, the uh, number of b's plus the number of c's. So there is a, now a relationship between the counts of the variables, so i is related to j and k here. And what we can then do is to note that i can't be bigger than j plus k. Each of the a's here is going to correspond to at most one b and one c because it's at most the sum of the two here. And this equals is actually gonna make this really easy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a start variable right here called s. And so since the a's appear at the beginning, that means that we got to match them up with the C's and then potentially make more C's as we need to because we could have more because this says less than or equal to. And then once we're done, we got to match up the A's and B's together later and then potentially make more B's there too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have A, S, C. So at this point, we're matching A's and C's up. So at this point, they're an equal number. Then what do we do? We're going to say, well, you can make more C's if you want to. I'm not going to require it, but I'm going to say, you can make more C's. And then once we're done the C part, we got to start making B's potentially, although we don't have to. So then I'm going to have another variable called X, because if I had some rules involving B upstairs with the S, then what will happen is we can have B's and C's being interchanged, whereas here we have to have them before the C's and we don't want that. When we come down here, I'm gonna do a very similar idea. So here, I'm gonna have one A be generated for every B, or at most one A for every B. I can make more Bs if I want, and I could make the empty string if I want to. So let's consider the pathological case of the empty string. So is the empty string in here? Well, if the empty string's in here, then all three variables are zero, and zero satisfies this equation for all three, and I can go through fairly easily to make the empty string. So if we look at any random string, so I'm just gonna pick one out of a hat. So let's say I have two A's and then one B, one C. So it's right on the border of being in the language. Well, is this in the language? Well, if we do S, then A is C, if we make this rule, so that means I'm going to generate that. So the C's are done at this point, and then now we make go into x, so x can x make a b, and it certainly can by applying this rule, and then making x go to empty string. So this is a grammar for the language a to the i, b to the j, c to the k, where i is at most j plus k. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about these grammars into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.